Morning. Morning. How's everyone doing today? Good? Good. Uh, today, uh, we'll be learning about Jesus' command to love one another. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, thank you uh, so much for your humble and sacrificial love uh, that you came and were the servant of all, uh, and you gave uh, your own life to save us. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray, help us uh, to hear your very important words today, uh, your very important uh, new commandment. Help us to be able to take these words to heart and uh, to be able to uh, put them into practice that uh, really our lives and our uh, relationships would, would show the fruit of your love. Uh, Father God, we thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, so, the title of today's talk is Love One Another. Continuing from last week's study, we are again in the upper room with Jesus. It's the day before Passover and Jesus' last evening with his disciples. As the precious moments fleet away, Jesus had some very important things to say to his closest and dearest friends. Let's listen to Jesus and learn from him. Judas, the passage starts out with, with Judas, was one of the 12 men chosen by God uh, to be a disciple. For three and a half years, he had followed Jesus everywhere, listening to Jesus' teaching, witnessing the, the divine miracles, sharing life in common, and even ministering alongside Jesus. In the end, however, Judas decided that following Jesus was a losing business. He sold Jesus to the religious leaders for a small bag of silver coins. He serves as a warning for what happens when we fall into Satan's trap of rejecting Jesus' love and choosing to love ourselves. So I like to have um, audience response in, in, when I talk. And so um, I am going to um, ask for five volunteers um, to read um, verses for us. Um, and then also, I will have a couple questions, um, and I um, really encourage your, your input, all right? So can I have five volunteers? Don't raise your hands all at once. One, two, come on, three, four, one more, going once, go. okay, five, okay, remember your number, okay. So one, two, three, four, five. Everyone remember their number? Okay. All right. Uh, volunteer number one, can you read verse 18 for us? It's on the screen. Uh, I am not referring to all of them. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Thank you. At this time, Jesus alerted his disciples to the fact that one of them was a betrayer. It says that Jesus knew those he had chosen. He could see what was in each of their hearts. He saw that in Judas' heart was hypocrisy and greed, love of money. From this, we learn that we can't hide anything from Jesus. Not only does he see everything we do and hear every word that we say, he knows what's in our hearts the hidden things, the thoughts that we and desires and motivations that we think we can hide. This quote is from Psalm 41, verse 9. He who shared my bread has turned against me. It was written by the King David, um, who was betrayed by his own son Absalom and his close personal advisor and friend Ahithophel. 
Absalom, with the help of Ahithophel, usurped David's throne and tried to kill David. Imagine that. Your son trying to take your position and trying to kill you. How unthinkable, right? Um, and, and as a result, a bloody civil war ensued. That phrase, he who shared my bread, um, is significant in Middle Eastern culture. Uh, eating together was a sign of true friendship. So to share someone's bread and then betray them was the worst, the worst kind of betrayal, the worst kind of treachery. Volunteer number two, can you read verse 19? Oh, we skipped ahead. Verse 19 for us, please. Good. Did everyone hear that? Good. Um, Jesus knew that his disciples would be devastated, totally shocked, saddened, and angered by the events that were coming. But by telling them the events that were going to happen ahead of time, he demonstrated that he was trustworthy. Jesus knew exactly what would happen and could have prevented it. He was truly in control of the situation. But Jesus had a purpose. What was Jesus' purpose? It says that so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Christ who is chosen by God for this very purpose, to suffer and die and rise again to save us. Jesus continued in verse 20. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts me, um, or sorry, very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Jesus is God. He is the Lord, the self-existent creator who clothed himself in human flesh and came to restore our broken relationship with him. Let's believe that Jesus who is who he says he is, that Jesus is God who came to save us from our sins. Volunteer number three. Um, can I ask you to read verse 21, please? After he had said this, Peter was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one who is going to betray me. Thank you. Betrayal by a close friend is the worst kind of pain. We expect attacks from our enemies, but to be stabbed in the back by someone we love and trust is unbearable. Who here is old enough to remember the movie Ben-Hur? <laughs> okay, so a couple. All right, for those who are not old enough to remember Ben-Hur, um, who has seen The Force Awakens? Okay, all right. So in both of these uh, stories, um, we see examples of betrayal by someone very close. Um, on the left, you see Ben-Hur and his close friend, Masala. Uh, they shared bread together. Ben-Hur was a Jewish prince and Masala was a, um, a Roman, uh, a Roman uh, uh, soldier. Uh, but they grew up together as close friends. But then Masala betrayed Ben-Hur and had his, uh, his family arrested and had Ben-Hur thrown, uh, thrown in jail. Um, and then, um, who knows these characters on, on the right side? Who are they? Okay, Han Solo and who else? Ky Kylo Ren, did I hear Kylo Ren? Okay, good. 
So for those of you who are older and have not seen this movie, um, the Han Solo, uh, he's, a, you know, he's one of the main characters in the Star Wars series. And then Kylo Ren on the right side is his son. Um, and so uh, very powerfully and unexpectedly in the, the movie The Force Awakens, um, Han Solo is trying to bring his son back to, from the, the dark side. And then Kylo Ren, um, he's moved by Han Solo's love, but then he uh, surprising, very shockingly kills his father, right? right? And so, <clears throat> so uh, these are, are very powerful stories, uh, very, um, because of uh, how devastating betrayal is uh, from someone who's very close, right? Uh, Peter and John wanted to find out who would betray Jesus. Maybe they wanted to fight the traitor, arrest him. Um, Peter motioned to John, and John asked Jesus. Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. In that culture, the head of the household would dip choice pieces of bread or meat and then give it, give those pieces to honored guests or beloved uh, friends. After dipping the piece of bread, Jesus handed it to Judas. What irony in the symbolism. Jesus is offering his friendship and his love to Judas. Jesus loved Judas to the end. Judas, on the other hand, received the bread without hesitation. But, as it says in verse 27, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Uh, what a powerful portrayal of hypocrisy. Outwardly, Judas receives Jesus' gift, also affirming the friendship and the love, but inwardly, he had already made up his mind to hand Jesus over to his enemies. Uh, Jesus saw that Satan had entered Judas. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. There was nothing more that could be done for Judas, so Jesus sent him away. As verse 30 says, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Again, we note the powerful symbolism. Jesus rejected the light of Jesus and chose to dwell in the deep darkness of sin. Judas serves as an example for us. Jesus is very patient, and he loves us to the end. He gives us, he offers us his friendship again and again. Um, he doesn't desire for us to perish, but he wants us to turn uh, yet, if we persist in hypocrisy and in self-love, the night is coming when it will be too late to repent. Uh, so, um, let us think, is there anything that we're trying to hide from Jesus? Is there anything uh, that uh, we're trying to cover up? May God help us to confess our sins and receive Jesus' forgiveness today. All right, uh, let's read verse 31 together. Ready? Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. Jesus declared that his time for glorification had come. What image comes to mind when you think of someone being glorified? This is an audience response question. What image comes to mind? Okay, James. 
explain this and a lot of um, a really big audience applauding. Okay, great. Bright lights, big, uh, uh, lots of applause. Good. How about um, any other examples? Who, who in the world is uh, is is glorified? Okay, Super Bowl champions. Okay, good. They have a, a big parade, right? The confetti comes down after they win the game, right? Good. Um, perhaps you see an Olympian standing proudly on the podium wearing the gold medal. Or maybe uh, you see uh, a scientist receiving the Nobel Prize for their life's contributions to the field. Do you know who the, the people in the middle are? I heard Crick. Yeah, Watson and Crick, right? What'd they discover? Yeah, that's right. That's the, the model there. They discovered DNA, right? And they received the Nobel Prize for that. Oh, pardon? Gotcha. Yeah, they may have stolen someone's work. But. <laughs> or, and who's this person on, on the right? Yeah, or maybe you see an, uh, an actor receiving that, that coveted Oscar award, right? Uh, best actor, right? Everyone wants to receive that award. But when we think about Jesus, let's think about Jesus and what he was about to face. Betrayal, arrest, rejection, torture, and crucifixion. No thank you, right? That, that doesn't sound like glory at all. Uh, but, but Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. Jesus was confident and full of hope. After his suffering and death, he would rise from the grave as the mighty victor over sin and death and Satan. For it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Through this glorious victory, Jesus would save the world from sin and restore our broken relationship with God. Jesus' death and resurrection is glory to God. Jesus knew uh, that the time with his disciples was running out and they still needed to learn a very important lesson. Verse 33, Jesus said, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come. Jesus loved his disciples as his own dear children. Jesus desperately wanted his disciples to hear and accept his very important words. What was the mo- this important lesson that Jesus needed them to learn? Let's read verse 34 together, please. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Let those words sink in for a moment. What an amazing challenge, and what a great calling. In the same way that Jesus has loved us, he commands us to love each other. How has Jesus loved you? How would you describe uh, Jesus' love? Um, this, sorry, the slide didn't work probably, but um, this is an audience response. How has Jesus loved you? How would you describe Jesus' love for you? He loved me unconditionally. Yeah, unconditionally. Yeah, his love is forgiving, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
He's patient, right? He's merciful, kind. He's gracious, abundant, powerful, fierce. The, so, really, to understand this command, we have to understand and we have to remember how Jesus has loved us. <clears throat> so the command to love is not a new concept in the, in the Bible. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, Jesus command, uh, the Lord commanded the Israelites, love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus' command is the new command because it's a much higher standard. He calls us to love with his holy, humble, and sacrificial love. Um, our fourth volunteer, uh, can you read uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 8 for us, please? Try to do this here. Sure. Uh, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thank you. Remember last week, we saw Jesus did the dirty job of foot washing that none of his disciples wanted to do. This job was reserved for the lowest of slaves. Yet Jesus, Lord and Master, King of all kings, the incarnate deity, washed his disciples' feet. Furthermore, Jesus' humble and sacrificial love led him to the cross. Kings throughout history have demanded that their subjects die for them. But Jesus, the King of all kings, died for unworthy and ungrateful sinners like you and me. Jesus teaches us what love really is, and this is the glory of God. The disciples' minds must have been blown. They were not operating in the realm of love, but rather of competition, self-promotion, and strife. They were always looking for ways to put each other down and exalt themselves. But Jesus showed them true greatness in humble and sacrificial love. Some of us may be thinking Jesus' standard is too high. It's unattainable. That is correct, in a sense. We cannot love as Jesus has loved us, except by the transforming power of his Holy Spirit. The disciples had to see Jesus die on the cross and then meet him, risen from the dead, before they could understand and accept Jesus' humble and sacrificial love. Afterwards, the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them on the day of Pentecost, and they were changed. They were able to really love each other and the love that marked their relationships, that caused them to share everything in common, to pray together continually, and to work together for the gospel, became the most powerful testimony of the gospel. Um, our last volunteer, can I um, ask you to read verse 35, please? Thank you. The mark of Jesus' disciples is genuine love. Genuine Christ-like love is such a powerful and moving testimony for unbelievers. When it says everyone will know, it's talking about those outside the church, those outside the fellowship, the world. Uh, the mark of believers is, is Christ-like love. 
Our family knows a young woman who came from a broken home. She was raised by her grandma and foster parents. Uh, she had a hard time trusting people uh, because uh, she felt abandoned by her own parents and she had to move from place to place in the foster care system. As an adult, uh, she moved to Chicago to attend university. She looked for a part-time job as a babysitter and was, was hired by two Christian families every Friday night. Week after week, she saw the children and parents smiling and bright faces, and she was struck by their genuine love and care for each other and their humble lifestyle. She could sense love, peace, and joy in the home and among the families. She invited herself to one-to-one -to -one Bible study and Sunday service. She was drawn to Christ by the authentic community, and in a few short months, she was baptized into the family of believers. A people yearn for loving and genuine community. Um, and uh, God uses a loving Christian community to draw people to himself. On the contrary, uh, there is no worse witness than Christians who do not love. How tragic it is when the world sees the church filled with dissent, infighting, and hatred. First Corinthians says that without love, we are nothing. And then no matter what we say, we are but a clinging symbol. Uh, so let's look at verses 34 and 35 uh, together again and read this together. Ready? A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So, um, so we can do good deeds, share the gospel, um, s serve others, and these are important, but without selfless love. Uh, in our homes and churches, uh, we labor in vain. Um, and so um, this passage challenges me and challenges, I'm sure, each of us to uh, really uh, examine um, our love. Uh, have we accepted, believed and accepted Jesus' glorious love? And um, are we are we depending on him to love, uh, love each other and love people uh, genuinely? Is there someone in, in your family you're struggling to love and serve? A rebellious child, a spouse, or a sibling? Is there someone in the community that God is challenging you to love? Um, I think uh, Jesus really um, wants us to consider consider this and and uh, really experience and and uh, practice His glorious love. In the final verses of this chapter, uh, Peter was very troubled by Jesus' words. He did not want to be separated from Jesus for one moment. Uh, Jesus said uh, reassuringly, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter said that he would lay down his life for Jesus. Uh, but Jesus um, revealed that Peter would disown him three times. Uh, Peter talked the talk, but was not ready to walk the walk. Uh, he was not ready to lay down his life for Jesus. He was just trusting in his own abilities, his own devotion and determination, which was not enough. But Jesus didn't despise Peter. Instead, uh, he loved Peter and uh, saw his upcoming failure as an opportunity for Peter to experience uh, failure and forgiveness and uh, experience the love of Christ and to learn to practice that love. So, um, in conclusion, uh, today uh, we are um, we are both 
uh, challenged and encouraged. Uh, Jesus um, has a very important lesson uh, for us. Um, and um, the uh, and we can't, we can't um, uh, we can't uh, complete the great commission uh, without uh, following uh, the great commandment of Jesus. And so, um, uh, Jesus loves us, and He loves the world with a humble and sacrificial love, um, and He um, He commands us. Uh, not, not to burden us, uh, but so that we can uh, really experience uh, His glory uh, through lo- uh, through loving each other and loving uh, the people of the world. Uh, so let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you and uh, praise you. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for your word uh, today, uh, which is uh, both uh, very glorious and encouraging and also very challenging. Uh, Thank you uh, for really loving us uh, so humbly and sacrificially. uh, And um, and, uh, thank you for calling us to join you uh, in this this way of life and this uh, really divine love. Uh, please uh, have mercy upon us. Uh, help us to be able to take uh, your word to heart and to really experience uh, the power of your death, resurrection, and Holy Spirit uh, to enable us to love each other and to love uh, the people of the world. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>